let's say I'm talking to a Republican congressman who uh, is interested in the conversation, but he's generally leaning against us on climate action. Uh, the most difficult conversation uh, in that setting is, well, you want to, what, you want to price carbon? You want to increase the cost of fossil fuels? What's that going to do to a manu a small manufacturer in my district? It's going to raise their energy costs. It's going to reduce job and jobs and employment. Why would I embrace that? And, and, and even if that made sense to uh, uh, price carbon in that fashion, politically, it seems suicidal to me. Well, that's a pretty strong argument because Fundamentally, it's correct. If you are going to, uh, even if you're not using carbon pricing, let's assume you're just using regulatory power uh, and you're going through a more conventional route to decarbonize the economy, the reality is, is you are going to impose costs. And that is absolutely unavoidable, uh, at least until low carbon energy uh, does a little bit better in the marketplace. So that's a very, that's a very strong argument. Now, how do you counter it? You're like, well, what are the costs of not acting? And how many people in your district are going to be harmed from that? It turns out the cost of not acting in the median scenarios from climate change are more than three times greater than the cost of acting. Mm -hmm. So there will be costs. The only issue is uh, how large they're going to be and who's going to bear them. You know, it turns out that if you use the revenue from a carbon tax to also rebate back to taxpayers or reduce other taxes, uh, the manufacturer who is harmed by the carbon tax may be benefited by uh, uh, reductions in, say, the corporate income tax rate, which we could do if we had carbon tax revenue coming in. Uh, and then there's other assistance programs and things of that nature uh, that we could put in place to reduce the economic impact. And in fact, most of the economic models that have been done, which have looked at different program designs for a carbon tax, finds that the uh, the absolute cost of a carbon tax in the national economy is fairly trivial. It doesn't have much of an impact at all. Now, if you're talking to my old uh, friends at the Heritage Foundation or CEI or Cato <coughs> or AEI or places like that, who are climate skeptic, uh, it's really just a straight up science conversation for the most part. Uh, they're, you know, they will go to their grave believing that climate change is a, you know, uh, uh, another example of environmentalists crying wolf, not unlike the scares about industrial carcinogens uh, or uh, uh, population uh, bombs going off that were popular in the 60s and 70s. They really believe that and they'll take that to their grave. And there's not very much you can do about that conversation. Uh, simply because they refuse to, you know, really, uh, with an open mind, examine the evidence and the science. Uh, and, of course, that's, it's not necessarily a problem exclusively on the right. There are a lot of people on the left and other places of the ideological spectrum who uh, are not particularly interested in doing a clear-eyed, open-minded due diligence exercise on something they firmly believe uh, in the policy world. It's just not human nature to do it. Um, and then for others in the libertarian world that I used to uh, be involved in, the other concern is that, well, to respond to climate change requires government action. It requires government intervention in the economy. It requires the constraint on property and capital. And that's a very, very hard thing for libertarians or conservatives to accept. And so they have a lot of motivated cognition to find reasons for why that's not necessary, which is, in my opinion, why you have such a hot debate about the science.